Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Kia ora tato. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you very much. Now, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, endorse Thinking Matters, just as a whole ministry. Uh, I think this ministry is absolutely world-class, brother. Um, it is totally needed in this nation. And uh, I just pray with uh, all else of you who believe, Father, I just pray that you would continue to bless this ministry, that attendance and gatherings like this will increase uh, dramatically over the years that are in front of us, uh, that the Christian church within New Zealand would know what it believes and would know why it believes what it believes, so that we would be able to engage the vital conversations taking place in our nation. We ask in Jesus' name. Also, Lord, please help me say something sensible. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm talking about what difference uh, did Jesus make? And uh, very simply, he made all the difference. That really, to me, would, would summarize this. And I think the session that you've just given, Adam, absolutely fantastic introduction for my message. Thank you for pre preparing that. So, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, Jesus is either the Son of God or he is the most outstanding human being who has ever lived. Right? And it really just comes down to that. And if we don't want the spiritual within it, well, he's the most outstanding and influential person ever. If we can accept the spiritual, I believe he is the Son of God. A great quote just to establish this uh, before going into an absolute minefield of content that I'll take you through over the next four hours uh, is uh, from Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military leader, uh, who was uh, not a Christian. And uh, to him, he said that religion was a tool to be used. He said that if uh, he was ever to establish himself in a Muslim nation, uh, sorry, he, he would make himself a Muslim to establish himself in Egypt, and that if ever he was to govern a nation of Jews, he would reestablish the Temple of Solomon. So he was a very pragmatic kind of man. And yet when he looked at Jesus, he said these words and, and abbreviated. He says, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a man, uh, meaning not an average man. Clearly, he was a man. Um, Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and whatever other religions the distance of infinity. He is truly a being by himself. His ideas and sentiments, the truth which he announces, his manner of convincing, the nearer I approach, the more carefully I examine, everything is above me. I search in vain in history to find the similar to Jesus Christ or anything which can approach the gospel. Neither history nor humanity nor the ages nor nature offer me anything with which I am able to compare it or explain it. Here, everything is extraordinary. Now, I think that he actually overstated it from his own uh, religious worldview to say there is between Christ and uh, whatever other religions, the distance of infinity. Uh, however, for those of us who are Christian believers, that is quite literally what we believe uh, that there is. What difference does Jesus make? Uh, let's enter a minefield. And uh, where I'd like to start with all of this is with uh, life's big questions. Thanks to Ravi Zacharias for an excellent little outline we can all remember. Uh, the great questions of life are origins, morality, meaning, and hope. Everyone say it to your neighbor. Go. Origins, morality, meaning, and hope. If you want to engage in a spiritual conversation, how do you define what is or isn't spiritual? Whenever you connect to these four topics, you're really entering the world of spiritual conversation. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the wairua, the holy stuff, which uh, all is uh, quite uh, kosher, quite allowed within New Zealand. It is the topics of origins, morality, meaning, and hope. Where do we come from? Uh, do good and evil exist? And on what basis do we believe it? Uh, meaning, why are we here? What's our purpose in life? And hope, is there anything really to look forward to? Uh, let's analyze this uh, very quickly. Three questions we'll go through. And the first is the logical consistency of some broad world views so that we can create comparisons to, to kind of see what difference Jesus can make to our intellectualism, uh, to our uh, emotional psychology in life and how we feel about ourselves, but also in the experiential reality of every day. Uh, first of all, related to the three world views to introduce them, sorry, atheism, first of all, uh, the word a means without, theos is God, without God. Pantheism, uh, you pan your eyes across the, across the horizon, uh, all the religions are the same. So pantheism and obviously theism is the belief in God. To go through atheism for a very quick reflection. I would suggest that when it comes to the question of origins, uh, atheists these days would say that they do have an answer. And uh, it's been said that Darwin bought 
uh, really an intellectual basis uh, or, or gave uh, a basis for intellectual credibility for atheism. Uh, I put a question mark next to whether or not uh, atheism actually has a, a creation myth that can stand intellectual questions because there are so many great intellectual questions that stand against the, the theory of naturalistic evolution through and through, which simply remain unanswered. And I say that as someone who has borne the brunt of many angry atheists uh, through our first Hope Project uh, booklet, hundreds of them, uh, usually starting with lots of expletives and, and various uh, colourful words, a lot of creativity out there, uh, to which we would, uh, we would respond never to argue. But actually just to come back and say, look, uh, our society is multi-religious and uh, there needs to be tolerance and tolerance is the ability to, to tolerate differences. We're not telling you you have to be Christian. Don't tell us we have to think like you. But we certainly think that the Christian belief is logical. We're very happy to engage a conversation if you would like. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for your feedback. We appreciate that and we would leave it there. And uh, all but two. Uh, actually engaged that conversation with us. And so it was fantastic and, and a lot of emails and a lot of time in that in the first phase of the HOPE project. Um, however, this, there are significant questions. You know, how do you get a whole universe from nothing? The beginning of time, space and matter. Now, how do you get life from non-life? You simply can't. The, the complexity of life doesn't work. There are equally a, a stack of philosophical questions to do with our psychology and our sense of self and various other things. How do you get the biodiversity that we have? And um, very simply, you know, if, if mutation is the mechanism by which the species turn into entirely different species over time, uh, then that not only, we not only need positive mutations that do that, that can accumulate, but we need additional DNA information. There's the whole question of information science. And as far as I'm aware, there's not yet a single example that we have of a positive mutation that also, there are positive mutations, but that also added new DNA information that was written all by itself. And yet we would need to have many hundreds, if not thousands of these, as the basic evidence were naturalistic evolution to explain the, um, you know, the multitudinous number of different uh, species that we have were actually to be true without a God on the picture. So I put a question mark there, but quite obviously uh, many people believe that's credible. But just to follow through the simple logic of this, um, if there is no God to define morality, then morality has come about by itself in our minds. And uh, therefore, we make up morality. And so what we have is morality, not morality. And they are two different things. So for example, the atheistic professor Michael Ruse says that the person who thinks abusing children is acceptable uh, is as wrong as the person who thinks that two plus two equals five. The problem with his argument is that you can defeat his argument by saying, no, it's not. Right, because at the end of the day, if there is no God, we each get to make up our own morality. And it really is that simple. Uh, also, there is no real meaning in life. You could say that the meaning is procreation. Uh, however, this is within a, a whole context of existence that has no meaning. And so I think if we just look at the big picture for meaning, I think it's fair enough to put a cross there. And of course, finally, there is no hope other than death itself to escape suffering if you're experiencing it in life, uh, because... Well, this life is all there is, and it's a bit of an anomaly, and the very fact that you think you're in this room is kind of an illusion and an anomaly itself, and we will come back to that later on. Uh, in contrast, uh, we could go across to the pantheistic religions, and, and really to have a logically consistent view, I would suggest the first column is logically consistent as a worldview. Um, the second one would be logically consistent. Uh, there is uh, no creation myth for the Eastern religions which claims to be true. I've had the privilege of living in Asia nine years. I remember once ending up next to a Buddhist teacher. So not just a monk, but a teacher who's sort of an academic. And I was quite excited because I had a range of questions. And I asked about how the four powers kind of knew what to do to create everything. And the answer was very simply, oh no, we don't talk about that. And I tried to ask the question in two or three different directions and eventually realized that he wasn't even remotely claiming that his religious beliefs were true. They were just true for him. In other words, what are these religions? Uh, Buddhism, I, I wonder if it really is a contingency plan for suffering. In other words, in the absence of revelation as to what the spiritual reality is out there and how we came to exist, how do we deal with suffering and these realities that we face in life? And so the Eightfold Path of Buddhism uh, gives us a way of dealing with suffering. We have to remove all desires. And if you get rid of all desires, how will you ever be disappointed if you just consider the logic of it? If I never desire to be healthy, then I'm not disappointed when I'm not healthy. But, but is this a realistic way to live? Because who can not have good desires for their children, uh, for instance? 
Um, so so there's, really, there's no morality it would follow, there's, there's no uh, direct meaning for life, and ultimately there's not a great deal of hope. Uh, to consider the Indian, uh, sort of the Hinduism, uh, as a religion, just logically looking at it, consider that we have the caste system, uh, and which, is, which is really uh, incredibly fatalistic. You're born into a caste, and that's your lot in life determined by your karma. But what does this do to compassion, which would be a high Christian value? What does this do to charity and concern? And the fact is that it undermines them entirely. Because if you interrupt someone's karma by helping them their status be raised, then they don't receive the suffering in this life they're supposed to because of that karma, and you actually affect them in a negative way in their next uh, reincarnation. And so there is no inherent motive, even within it, to address suffering and to change it. And if you are suffering and, and all of that, you're kind of being encouraged not to try and make your life better, not to pursue an education and change the circumstances. And so uh, logically consistent, I, I think that would, would be the case. At the same time, it's got to be noted, there's a lot of great teachings within the Eastern religions. There's a lot of great philosophies for dealing with life and its problems and challenges, uh, and a lot of great wisdom for life in there as well, just so we have balance in, in what we are and aren't saying. Uh, to bring to the, the next one, uh, which is theism. By the way, the little clock on this that I was talking about, Rodney, I'm going to start it now. Isn't that a great idea? Awesome. I just gained a minute. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Christianity, I would think, is just straight ticks. And, and by the way, uh, you can tell by my creativity that I don't know how to put ticks on PowerPoints. Uh, I'm sure you've worked that out already. Explanation tick. They look similar, right? Yeah, good. Uh, origins. Christianity has, has something that is logically consistent. Uh, time, space, and matter began somewhere, right? So in the beginning, there's, there's your time. God created the heavens. There's your space and the earth. There's your matter. Very first verse, what we understand has to have happened. God was the uncaused first cause. Who created God? Well, no one created God because he existed before time. How can there have been anyone before him? It's kind of not logical. right? He, he is beyond us. And in any case, you don't have to understand the cause of the cause to believe that the cause existed. If I drive out and find there's a ding in my car and I don't know how it happened, I don't need to know who banged my car and how and why and where they came from to know that there is a ding in my car and that somebody did it. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? So um, that addresses Dawkins' um, primary point, in fact, I believe, in, in the, um, the God delusion. Um, it logically follows that if God exists, he determines morality. As there are laws of nature, uh, there are moral laws. And, and these aren't just moral preferences. These are laws in terms of if I defy gravity and jump on my head right here, it won't go very well for me. Uh, and in the same way, if I choose to break moral laws, then either in my life or in others' lives, there will be implications that are going to be detrimental and negative. God didn't make up the laws randomly. God applied his very nature and character, which is love and which is good. And so with the incredible breadth of perspective he had, he looked at us as Adam and Eve created faultless and knew what was going to happen. And he began to put through time laws in place that would guide us and help us to not kill ourselves and to wreck our lives. And if we look at the breakdown of morality, for example, within our society, trying to free sexuality from the constraints of the traditional um, you know, moral uh, codes, uh, I don't think there's been anything more destructive within our society. And uh, um, just as a simple illustration, we could all march down streets and protest the, the pain uh, and, and the suffering of children getting beaten up by their parents and, and make a book hoopla about it if we like. And it would be great to draw attention to such an evil, but it's addressing it at entirely the wrong conceptual level. If we could keep sex inside a marriage, children would be well off. And uh, I'm going to leave addressing that till another time because that's too far off topic. Um, Hope, of course, there is with Christianity. And Christianity, it may be in one of the seminars this weekend, has exceptional answers for the problem of suffering, uh, both for where it came from in the beginning, uh, in terms of who is responsible for it, in terms of why God might be allowing suffering to continue for a set period of time, including God's big macro plan that will bring the solution to it. Uh, if we were ever angry at God for the problem of suffering, uh, just consider what your alternatives are. Let's all be angry at God because we, we see no hope because he's the cause of our suffering. And now what other religion are you going to turn to to find anything better? Uh, the reality is that suffering is a global problem, not a Christian problem. And uh, within Christianity, there is one of the best solutions ever. Uh, and so my, my first point is very simply that if we are to analyze uh, Christianity, 
Uh, here are three simple tests for something that might be true. There are more tests than this. Uh, but the first one is logical consistency. I think it is possible to be an atheist, a pantheist, or a theist, and to be logically consistent. However, the above worldviews would kind of be the framework of what you would need to believe to be such. Which leads to the second area of analyzing the difference Jesus makes and uh, the poles apart that there is between theism uh, with Christ, which is b b more than theism, uh, as compared to atheism and pantheism. And that is the logical adequacy. Uh, I think this title might better be the, the psychological adequacy uh, or, or the human adequacy of these views. Because who likes to wake up in the morning and think there's no purpose for your life? Any show of hands here today, you know? Who would love to believe that you have no reason to be here and you're useless? Anyone feel useless today? I see that hand. Fantastic. Who would like all hope destroyed? I can help you. You know? Um, yes. Who thinks they're here tonight? This is an important question. I'm sorry, I have to I put my hand up to see. This is important. Who thinks they're here? Out of interest, does anyone not think they are here? Okay, very good, very good. Now, um, it, just to point it out, I think there are, there are some demographics that should not think they are here if we're going for logical consistency. And the question is whether or not these worldviews are really livable in a real way. What is the sense of self that convinces you that you're here? Because you really think you're here right now listening to me. You are convinced of it. In fact, right now, I'm convinced that I'm standing here talking to you, hoping that I somehow find my way through the quagmire of things that I might accidentally say uh, through this talk. Um, you're convinced that you exist, and, and you're convinced that you can think, and this is called self-awareness. But did you know that if atheism is true, then that uh, all by itself is kind of an accident and a bit of an illusion, because you're kind of nothing, and you're an accident of chance. Right? You think you think rationally, but your rational thinking is just chemicals in the brain because there is no you. Your concept that there is a you, that, you, that there is a soul or there is a spirit, it's just a, it's a concept that you have. But without God, that concept isn't real. You're nothing other than biology, which accidentally got programmed, but it accidentally must have programmed itself. No one could have programmed it because it has to have been by itself. Um, and it's really just conf too confusing to even know how to explain. Um, it, it's called determinism. And it's uh, an argument that I've heard from atheists, not, not from someone opposed to atheism, uh, really saying that there is no free will, that the sense of self is an illusion. You'd appreciate that the, the Eastern religions talk openly about that, the sense of self is an illusion. Let go of your sense of self and you know, embrace the fact that you're part of the universal nothingness and, and all of that. Um, but it therefore means that all of your decisions, the whole concept of free will, the vital sort of point here, just imagine that sitting there as words that we're going to come back to, uh, is, is not real. It, it comes from your genes and it comes from your previous experiences and those two things combined determine everything that you are going to do. You see, and so without free will, because there is no you to have free will, um, it, it follows that you can't really appreciate beauty. So beauty is an anomaly again, it's an illusion. Uh, but, but also there can be no love, because love requires free will. Uh, a gun to your head and I say, be my friend, you say, yes, okay, you're my slave. Or alternately, I say, be my friend and you're not able to choose otherwise, you're a robot. There's got to be free will to be love, but, but it doesn't exist. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's too confusing. It's too confusing even for me to talk about and explain. Uh, and it carries on to the whole area you would appreciate of morality. That if there is no God, um, then actually am I morally culpable? How can I be morally culpable if all my decisions are nothing other than the product of my genes and of um, uh, my previous experiences? And again, to express it, this is a, an atheistic argument. In other words, I'm simply saying that it, it's not livable. You can't live without believing you exist. You can't get out of bed in the morning without believing there is hope or that there is a purpose to your life. Uh, and it's possible to contrive purposes. It's possible to come up with a religious worldview that, that, or, uh, or worldview for life, a philosophy for life that just gives you enough ideas and motives to exist and to enjoy life, but, but it's not logically consistent and it's not logically adequate. And this is where Christianity again uh, stands out in some... Uh, outstandingly uh, positive and amazing ways. It explains that you do exist. You do have a soul. Human life is significant and important because we're created in the image of God. 
We do have free will because we're made a living soul or being with a mind, will, and emotions. There is such a thing as beauty. There is objective morality. Uh, there is such a thing as love. Which makes Christianity absolutely outstanding when it comes to how you feel about yourself. When you wake up in the day, you do have purpose, you do have hope, you do matter, you do count. I was at a uh, social services um, conference late last year and uh, a speaker on the, the first day, uh, a government um, person, was, was up there and spoke and then someone asked a question about the suicide problem in New Zealand. And this person just talked about that they'd said that they weren't a Christian, they, they did a little bit of yoga, uh, but their expression was that, they, uh, that young people needed to be told just how important they were. They needed to know how much their lives really mattered. And uh, I was speaking the next day and didn't want to ruin my reputation before I started speaking. So, but I, was just, I just had a question I so wanted to ask. I didn't ask it, but the question was, sorry, why do they matter? And it's a really important question. Because without God, the fact is they don't. Without God, what is a human? It's an advanced animal. If you decide you don't like black people because you think they're lower down on the evolutionary scale, thank you, Darwin, let's just kill them off. There's really nothing wrong with that. Let's, uh, let's embrace Hitler's eugenics program and advance humanity along. Let's kill all the people who are disabled in any way. And if you happen to have an accident and end up a quadriplegic, sorry, you know, goodbye to you. And if we don't like the Jews like Hitler, let's just kill them off. And if the end justifies the means because humans are just animals, I mean, we kill black sheep, don't we? We might kill a whole flock to try and breed these ones here and make them better. If it's going to benefit in communism to do this, this, and this, but we have to kill all these ones, then there's really nothing wrong with doing it. And when we begin to look at all these things, we begin to see just the, the way that Christianity is absolutely awesome. So what we have here, very quickly already, which is good, is that Christianity and theism can offer, first of all, a, a logical consistency. Uh, which is unique amongst religion. Of course, uh, within that spectrum, you could have Judaism and Islam as well. They also can offer a logical adequacy. In other words, a basis for actually feeling good about life. These things make sense. Whereas, for example, to give you the contradiction in terms, um, I'm, in a, I'm down at the beach late last year uh, with a friend you know, and, and his wife, and our kids are all playing in the water over at Pilot Bay. And he throws, he's an atheist, and, and he throws one at me. And he says, you know, in the Bible... Uh, it says that when a man rapes a woman, that the man must be forced to marry her. And he says, you know, for me, he says, rape is just always wrong. And he says, I could never follow a God who dot, 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 dot. You know, the typical sort of atheist lines looking for illustrations to come angrily at. But you know what? The only thing that you need to do to counter an argument like that is just to point out, sorry, I don't understand. You said wrong. Right? Because the word wrong actually makes no sense. To be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, you have to let go of so many things. The, 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 the attacks that we get, consider even the, the advance of gay marriage. Uh, it's contrary to what the Bible says, uh, but it actually comes out of the Christian worldview because it comes out of the belief that individuals count and that human beings have rights and have value and that these sort of inalienable rights should in some way be respected. The question is just how far those rights actually go. And so even the arguments that go ultimately in favor of gay marriage, even though the Bible doesn't support that to that extent, come out of the presuppositions of the Christian faith. So um, thank you to Christianity. It has had an outstanding influence on every area of our lives in the West. But I want to move on to the final one, and that is the experiential relevance of it all. You see, if I was to bake you a cake, which I do about twice a year for birthdays to share the load with my wife, um, and I've actually got quite good at it. We've made some, some awesome cakes with my boys, just make heaps of icing. It's the key. You put dye in them, you make a massive cake, and do you know what? If the cake's broken and messed up, it makes no difference because icing covers every sin. And uh, yeah, it's very good. Um, I could try and make the cake that is the best cake in the world. Literally, the best one that exists. It's not only the best because it looks awesome. Like, I have made a 3D cake before that uh, had a bird or a plane at the top flying over a garden underneath it, and there was a waterfall and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it could be not only the best-looking cake, uh, but it also could be the cake that, from a scientific perspective, is the most nutritious cake that exists on the planet. And I've had a team of 40 scientists for the last four years working on a research project just to prove that these birthday cakes are actually the most nutritious. I've got the evidence, long reports that I could show you that there is. 
Uh, but also the human taste buds have been uh, being studied for the last several years as well. It's cost millions of dollars, this research. And, and, and that they've worked out the taste bud and what the taste bud likes. And, and this cake is just, it's the bomb. It is the best cake you're ever going to find, it, it, just on all the different spectrums that go up and down on the graphs when you do presentations to look awesome. All of those things go way high when you come to my cake, just in terms of what it's going to taste like. And it's the bomb. It's, it, it's really the best. But there's only one thing lacking. No one's actually tasted the cake yet, right? And that's really where we're up to in this talk, in that it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's one test to be logically adequate. In Christianity, you'll find lots of things through this conference. It's one thing to actually be emotionally adequate for our lives and to give us a view of hope and charity and benevolence and kindness and generosity and all of this. But does it actually work when you taste it? You know, we've heard through Adam some of the uh, examples of societal change around the globe. Uh, the equality of the races, the abolition of slavery in ancient and modern times, education for all, health care for all, women getting the vote, the whole current economic model. Um, it was John Calvin who threw out the idea uh, I read of uh, charging interest on money, which up until that point under Catholicism was considered to be usury, abusing the poor when you lend money you know, out of charitable means. But he said, uh, if I can lend property and, and charge rent for it, why can't I charge rent when I lend out money? Uh, but, but how would you work out what the interest rate was going to be? Well, here's the principle. Um, do to others what you'd have them do unto you. And so the whole capitalistic kind of economy and idea, uh, even that sprang out of Christianity and, and his revolutionary thinking. The sanctity of life. Uh, care for the poor. You know, for the young. For the elderly. Protection of the weak, the vulnerable, and the marginalised. Has Christianity and Jesus made a difference in the world? More so than any other. And the world would be nothing like it is without it. But what about in the experience of our lives? Christian programs are, uh, related to prisoners and drug addicts. You know, look at the worst of the worst. Uh, a great place to look to see the power of Christ in a person's life and to begin to understand the uniqueness of it. National averages for people who return to drug use uh, in uh, American uh, drug rehabilitation programs were shown to be in the range of 50 to 75% going back to drug use. By contrast, the church program and the survey that I was reading about uh, saw 20% go back to drugs, and a prison fellowship top program in the same survey saw just 9% go back to drugs. These are the sorts of things that different sociologists uh, have called the Jesus factor, it's been called cultural lift, it's been called redemption lift. The fact is that Christianity actually makes a difference when you taste it that nothing else makes. And this is a part of the equation that is absolutely vital. I love the series called Transformations. It's a video series that came out uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So, some of you may have seen that. I remember the story of Guatemala. Uh, absolutely incredible story of transformation over the last 30 years as that nation has gone from being a, a pagan superstitious nation to a significantly Christian nation. And they did a test case in this video series on a particular city, I forget the, the name of it. But in the city, I, I think it was, it was quite poetic in that you had about 30 pubs and three churches uh, and uh, three prisons. It, it was something to that effect. Uh, but then as they um, began to become Christian, dropping down fearful superstitions and embracing Christian faith, you ended up with 30 churches and three pubs and no prison. But also, as this community turned to faith in Christ, people became more honest and they began to work harder. People began to care for one another. Men began to feel convicted of the sexual abuse of their children and of the beating up and the domineering of their wives and began to repent of these things, confessing them publicly so that people knew what they had done and they were then embraced in love and charity and everyone expressed forgiveness and families were restored. All of this led to reductions in crime and the closure of the three prisons altogether, uh, the higher commitment to marriage and family, which also led to increased wisdom uh, in the way that they worked and governed themselves, increased diligence in their work, increased productivity, increased wealth, increased health, and increased happiness. This is the sort of thing that Christianity does. You see, Christianity, we have spiritual experiences. For, for myself, I would say that I came to faith at age 11. In my home, there was a degree of sadness. Uh, it, it wasn't a fully integrated, loving family with all the relationships going well. And 
my mum came to faith at age, when I was about age 11. And I remember looking at her and she was different. There was sunshine in her eyes. And I didn't know the difference between all the religions, but I knew my mum had found something real and I knew that I needed whatever she had. And so I came to faith in Christ simply because of that. Because I saw something not necessarily that was rational, even though I have since discovered that it is unbelievably so, but, but something that actually makes all the difference. And as I came to put my faith as an 11-year-old, uh, and our oldest son is 10, so I'm now having an appreciation for how incredibly small and young I was, uh, I had a revelation. God loved me the same as he loved everyone else. Now, I felt from my background that I was subhuman. I didn't have value or worth. I didn't have the right to talk to other people in my class. I, I literally felt uh, in my psychology, uh, I was damaged and felt I was subhuman, uh, to repeat myself. Would you like to hear it again? Subhuman, there we go. What a great communicator I am tonight. Awesome. Subhuman, there we go. Um, and I suddenly knew that I was equal to everybody else. And I went to school and I thought, that means I'm actually allowed to talk to these kids. That was a revelation to me. And I began to talk to other kids in my class. And I began to make friends. And I began to talk about the difference Jesus made. And I began to see some of my friends then in time. They came to faith as well. You know, when I was 11, sorry, 14, I had a new experience. I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is basically God present here on earth. And I went to this camp and someone talked about the Holy Spirit. And I thought, that's quite intriguing. God around that God might actually do something using his power. I never heard of that before. And anyway, someone prayed for me and, and I was open to God. God, if you're there, I'm, I'm cool with it, whatever, you know. And next moment, my heart was just filled with a sense of being loved that I can't explain. I can't explain this in a test tube experiment and put some litmus paper on my tongue and go, there you go, it was real. Uh, it, it, this, was, this was real. This was so real that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that God loved me. It was life transforming real. Not just an ecstatic experience, not just a spiritual experience that can be explained away as some, I don't know, some coercive thing by some manipulative person or an environment. No, no, I was changed in, in, in the core of who I was. I knew I was loved. The world now looked different. Who's ever heard of someone talking about the fact that they became a Christian and then the grass was greener and the sky was bluer than you've ever seen it before? This is a common thing that happens because something in our humanity changes when we put our faith in Christ. Because if, if the, there's a claim that there's holy water in the church, you go and drink that stuff, it's real. That's an analogy, by the way. There's nothing in the water. It's just from the tap, right? Same as the communion. It's just, um, if you go to a poor church, it's grape juice. If you go to a rich church, it's alcohol. Really good on, on those ones. And if you get to be the priest, you have to finish all the alcohol. It's a rule. And so always put plenty in there. Then the old vicar has to have a good drink afterwards. The vicar will be happy and, you know, all of that. Okay. So the inside workings of, of Christendom, very, very important stuff. Um, but, but God is real, and God can speak to us. My goodness. And it all begins to sound a bit airy-fairy, like we're hearing voices. But you know, you've really just got to take the journey to see. There's no way to know. There's no way to know until you taste it. I can give you all the scientific evidence and, and all the everything else. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, a pastor um, at our church... I'm nearly finished here. He asked a question uh, about uh, six months ago. And there's about 500 people in a service. And he said, how many of you here today would say that uh, coming to know Jesus was the best thing that has ever happened to you in your life? And practically every single hand went up. By the way, how many people here could say with all honesty that coming to know Jesus was the best thing that has ever happened to you in your entire life? You see... And that is something of the evidence of Christianity that can't be talked about in a science classroom and can't be put in a test tube, but it's experientially real. We're not the only ones to have spiritual experiences. Don't begin to think anything like that. Lots of religions have them. Hinduism in particular, there's a lot of um, uh, incredible and involved and dramatic spiritual experiences that go on uh, within Hindu religion. But the question is, what is a person like when they get up from that experience? What are they like when they walk out the door? Is it just a sense that they touched the divine with a little bit of change? Or could it be like when one of our Hope Project booklets was in a truck and a guy hops in his mate's truck and he's there and he sees the booklet and he, he takes a read of it, presumably not while he was driving. And um, he, he reads and he goes, you know, well, I, I think this could be true. There's something in it. And he says, look, God, if you're there, I choose to follow you. And something in his heart changed. He immediately realized that God probably didn't want him to be doing drugs. And he stopped doing drugs. 
And then he thought, you know, God probably doesn't want me to have stolen property and I own some. He returned stolen property. He still didn't have a Christian friend. He'd still never been to a church, but he was already changing from the inside out because this is the change that Christianity makes within our lives because there's something in the water. It's not just the logic and rationality that we'll hear about through this weekend, which we have to know to be able to provide a defense for our faith within a society that's trying to smash it, but it's the fact that it's also real. I could take you through stories. If you want to go to 10daychallenge.co.nz, it's a gospel discipleship website we created for the Hope Project. We're going to do some more updates over the next year before some things we have coming up, hopefully over the next five years. But you know, you could begin to just look at some of these video stories, you know, like Steph uh, and, and Helena, uh, who had uh, a motorbike accident and uh, quite some serious injuries. But then they prayed and they brought God into it. And there was quite a miraculous intervention and they know God had moved. And severe injuries uh, ended up, everything worked out for them. Well, how about Aaron, who felt he stuffed up his life when career didn't work out and a marriage didn't work out. Uh, he's a mate, he lives here in Tauranga. Reached a low point and just thought, okay, God, I give up. I I'm gonna listen to you now. Okay, God, you've got my life because I'm clearly not managing to make it great on my own. And God took hold of his life and his life has completely turned around and he would give all the glory to God. Or how about Pastor Timothy, who lives over in Rotorua, who had a, mo uh, a mountain biking accident, who is now a quadriplegic, sitting inside a wheelchair like this. And yet he doesn't just want to die. He can't take, I, I explain this to a young child. So you consider the psychology of the Christian faith. There's a 10 year old and he's saying, my life's worth nothing, I wish I was dead. The 10 year old comes from a Christian family. The principal says, boy, this boy needs a psychologist to sort out his head. I get with the boy and I say, you know what, you might be right. Maybe your life is worth absolutely nothing. Are you valuable only because of what you produce? And uh, this boy actually knows uh, who Timothy is. So I use Timothy as an example. And, and I said, okay, how about Timothy? Uh, let's just uh, imagine he can't do anything now, so should he be killed? I know it sounds really terrible to even mention the idea, but should we kill him? Is his value in his productivity or is his value in the, in, in the fact that God created him? You see, should a person, well, you know, Down syndrome, kids, man, they're getting got rid of before they get a chance to be born. But, you know, as a part of a society, these people teach us something. Our humanity becomes greater because of them. They're here for our blessing and our refinement as a culture and as a society and as individuals. And so I just reasoned through with this kid. And at the end of it, his whole attitude changed. You see, you don't fix depression or something with pills. You don't have to fix it with complicated psychology sometimes, though we sometimes need medication and need psychologists and all of that. And I've been to a counselor for things where I've struggled in my head and needed someone else's opinion and, and help to get through issues. But uh, within all of that, sometimes we just need to keep it real. And the Christian faith has incredible power in the substance of what it is. You know, consider Mike and Penny. They were in one of the Hope Project booklets, both from a domestic violence background. Um, so here they are in a marriage which has really got a lot of things not going so well in it. They live up uh, in Northland, uh, in Kaikohe. And uh, then Mike, uh, somehow, I can't remember how, becomes a Christian. He stops the drink, the booze, the drugs, the womanizing, and begins to love his wife and his daughters. Within a year, she's so frustrated because she's bitter at him that now she's the domestic abuser and one day puts a gun up to his head to shoot him. Then the kids are pleading for their father's life and she runs out of the house thinking, goodness, what's going on? And after two days of reflection, she looks at it and says, he completely changed. That's what Christianity does. Completely changes people, miraculously, because God is there, because God's in the picture, because God loves us, because God is present in this room by his Holy Spirit and he's invisible and he's here and he's calling us and he's knocking on our heart's door to say, will you believe in me? And as a result, she said, I need what you've got. Or consider Rob powerful story, uh, basically accosted, no, it's the wrong word, abducted at age 12, living in Holland during World War II. Straight away put into forced labor as a 12 year old. First night was spent inside a concentration camp where stacks of people are just getting massacred continuously. Cleaning up dead bodies and bombed cities, all of these things as a 12 year old. After the war, he says he could have killed every German, man, woman and child. Such was the hatred in his heart. And he asked a nurse after a motorbike accident in hospital after the war, could I have something to read? I'm just bored. She gave him the Bible. He's reading it and he reads the words, uh, love your enemies. And, and, and the power of God, it's all like it can be called, touched his heart. God touched his heart, love your enemies. That's what God calls us to. He loves us and he calls us to love others irrespective. And all his hatred towards every German on the planet melted away 
and love filled the place. The whole direction of his life, the whole nature of his relationships with family and everybody was completely changed because anger and bitterness as a driving force was completely removed. That's what an experience of Jesus does. And the same could be said of Nancy, whose husband died in the earthquake, or Amy and Hans and Lol and Marty and Shadrach and Rebecca and Jamie and Karenza and Peter and Lila and Petrina and a whole stack of others. And you can go and have a look at them if you want to be convinced. The Christian message is easiest summarized by these four words, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. It's the belief that there is a God out there. He created the world perfect, but he gave us free will because only then does love exist. But the danger, which he knew would always happen, and so he's created the best environment possible to contain this disaster. It's called planet Earth, and we're in the midst of it. And from an eternal perspective, only he knows what that best environment is. The problem is that we'd use our free will to become pridefully independent of him and to try and forge our own way. And we'd stuff it all up. We'd bring sin and evil into the world, and God's protection and favor on the world was pulled back, and suffering entered the world at all levels. Then God thought, I want to save these people. And so redemption history began. God trying to buy back what he considered to be his and what he always intended to be his. This culminates in Jesus, who was God in flesh, come to earth to die to take the sin or the punishment for the sin uh, that we have done upon himself on the cross. That's what that Easter story is about. Rising again to prove that what he said and did was true. If Jesus didn't rise, would he really have been the son of God? If he rose spiritually and we never saw him, you know, that would be a bit of a, you know, it wouldn't quite be logically adequate to me. But, but the story is logically adequate. He, he, he rose again. And uh, as a result, we not only have the ability to be restored to God by faith because of what Jesus did, but God is calling us to transform planet Earth. You know, Christianity was presented too simply 50 years ago. It's about heaven, it's about hell, and make your decision. It was all about that, wasn't it? The problem is that I decide to go to heaven and follow Jesus, but I look around and I'm still alive, and I've still hopefully got 40 years of living in front of me. What am I supposed to do while I wait? It's a very inadequate view of what Christianity is. It's not a call to get a ticket to a free movie that starts in 40 years. Uh, it's, uh, it's a call to have a relationship with the living God and to live out of his values. Uh, in which case your call is to change the world. That's the restoration part that we are called to. The uh, most famous Bible verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And here's your fundamental problem in here. We actually have to believe. And this is deliberately designed, if you can read the words there, to require some humility from us. You see, I think that the, the Christian worldview, to me, is, is logically cohesive. It works at both a logical level, uh, it works at a psychological, emotional level. It fits with reality. If, if reality says morality exists and my worldview says it can't, then probably there's something wrong with my worldview. We don't have these problems with Christianity. But it also works in experience, but all of this still will only take us so far because relationship with Jesus is unfortunately just over there. And the bridge only goes to here, and it's called faith. And faith requires humility. Man, I don't want to become a Christian because, man, if I, I don't want to be like all those other Jesus people. And it just seems so weak and feeble to let go of my pride and be in charge of everything myself. You see, it's the very point of it. Here I am, just for an analogy from Scripture, Revelations 3. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. Uh, I'm in the bed, you know, waking up uh, in the morning last week. We've got four boys. Three of them are already jumping on the bed, making a terrible noise by seven. They think, man, they get up early, half an hour to an hour before that. It's incredible. And, and I'm not up early enough to yell at them, you know, so it just keeps happening. It's this perpetual problem. Uh, I need someone who wakes up early to come and live with us for a while and just nail them back in their beds. But in uh, any case, while, while there's this noise and I'm trying to sleep because I'm always up late, I, I, I kind of think I heard the door knock. And I just thought, I, I reckon I heard the door knock, but I couldn't prove that I heard the dead door knock. It's very distant. I said, could you go and check? So our three-year-old runs out and comes back and says, no, there's no one there. But you know, I sit there for a minute and I think, you know what, I think I heard the door knock. So I, I, I get up and, 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 and put on appropriate clothes coverings and um, uh, you know, go outside and sure enough, there's a courier arriving on the dot of seven, probably waiting at the gate and, and, you know, for that very second and needing my signature. But here it is, God is standing at the door and knocking. If you don't believe that anyone can come to your house because it's impossible for anyone to come to your house at seven in the morning, then you would say, no, that wasn't knocking. But if you can open your heart to the idea that God might be there and might be reaching out to you, it's actually possible you begin to hear him knocking in your heart. 
It's actually possible that a conviction will begin to come into your heart that there's something real and true in this because God's spirit begins to move in your heart. And it's really uncomfortable because many of us in this room remember what this feels like. And you go far out, is there something to this or not? What's at stake? Man, so much is at stake. How am I to know? This is a step beyond the logic. This is a step beyond what I can prove. But, but, but it just seems to have something to it. You see, we have to go and we have to open the door. A relationship requires love and love requires a choice. A very final, simple Bible verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Friends, we've got to taste it. The cake is there. I can prove to you whatever data you want about it. We can put it through the university and the scientific studies. At the end of the day, it takes a step of faith. And uh, I would simply like to invite us all to stand this evening. I would like to give an opportunity for anyone who feels that tonight's your night to make that choice uh, to do so. So can we all just stand together? Uh, We'll just bow our heads and pray. And then while all of our heads remain bowed so that we don't embarrass anyone, uh, I'd just like you, if you would like to make that decision tonight and say, actually, yep, I'm going to take the step of faith. I want you just to raise your hands, then we'll say a prayer together, uh, which could be a simple prayer to you, uh, sorry, from you to God, to say, God, I want to start this journey from today, embracing the logic of my mind, but also the logic of, of faith that can come from that. Yeah, Father, I just ask by your spirit that you would touch the hearts of any here who do not know you, to reveal not only the logic uh, that can be within our minds in this logically cohesive and comprehensive worldview uh, we know as Christianity, but also to reveal that there's a reality and a power behind it. It's you, you love us, you desire for us to know you, to serve you, and to make this world a better place, just as our forefathers in many spheres and areas have made the world better. Yeah, just while every head is bowed, please, just so we don't embarrass people. Uh, Would anyone uh, like to make it a choice today? This is your night to actually say, God, I'm going to open that door. I think you might be knocking, and I can't prove it, but, but that's going to be me. Just raise your hand just very briefly so I can see. Uh, yeah, I see that. I see that. Thank you. Yeah, you, can, you can put them down again, yeah. Okay, anyone else? You want this to be your night to say, yep, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus from tonight. I believe, God, that you're out there somewhere. Anyone else? So going, going. Go on. Let's uh, pray a prayer. Can I invite everyone who loves Jesus to pray it uh, with me, uh, with us, uh, as a reiteration of your own faith as well? Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this incredible planet. Thank you for modern science. Thank you for the marvels of the cell, the beauty of a sunset and the existence of right and wrong that makes sense of things. Mm. Yeah. Thank you most of all for dying on the cross for me. I have done wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. I thank you for your forgiveness because you love me. I now give my life to you I ask that you would help me to live a life that pleases you. Help me to learn what you are like from the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah, Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for who you are. Help us truly, truly, Lord, help us to live lives that please you and to have vision and faith and belief to live that out, that we would indeed do uh, as those who have gone before us have done, uh, like Adam was talking earlier. Yeah, thank you for this time. Uh, we pray for those who, who made a, a choice today to begin a journey of knowing you. We pray that you would help them to carry on through in that. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Please consider supporting us to get more content just like this. Visit support.thinkingmatters.org.nz or click in the link in the description. If you really enjoy this topic and want to go further in depth, I would recommend purchasing Jesus the Game Changer by Carl Faze. We stock both Season 1 and Season 2 in our online store, which you can find a link to in the description.